now. I want to welcome Mr. Michael Mayer to our podcast, Surve Strasti, our Croatian podcast. Uh, thank you for being here, Michael. Thank you, Sasa. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be on. Thank you for having me. Yeah. You know, uh, six years ago, I was, I was trying to find everything I can on the topic of the referral, building the referral system. And I came to this book, Seven Levels of Communication, which you are the author of. And I started reading your book and I became so enthusiastic that like in the next two or three years, I didn't let anyone to join my uh, se seminars before they got a recommendation from someone. <laughs> that was pretty, pretty mad. You know that so you were working only by referral yeah i was working only by referrals for like two and a half years yeah that's fantastic i appreciate that and uh i'll tell you it's a great way to work you know mm. because of because of trust you know that's that's the thing that is i will tell you that the number one currency we have in life is is not money it's trust it's one of those where if somebody doesn't trust us, then uh, we're not going to be a successful. I mean, honestly, we're not going to be a successful salesperson. We're not going to be a successful business person, but we're not going to be a successful person in life. You know, the one thing that we have to do is we have to build trust. We have to have trust. And that's what happens with a referral is when somebody refers you, that person that comes to you already trusts you. And all you have to do is build on a foundation of trust. Hmm. The problem with most sales is that you're building on a foundation of distrust. You know, you're, 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 you know, they have a vested interest in the result. If they've advertised or you went to a Google ad or a Facebook ad, your, your alerts are up, your barriers are up. But if somebody's referred, you go in kind of with your barriers down and you, you just kind of, you just kind of buy which is what we want to do versus being sold, which is what we used to want to do. But that doesn't happen anymore because we're, we're in what I call the generosity generation. Now we used mm. to be in the ego era and the ego era uh, was this time where everybody was shouting, I'm number one, I'm number one. And the consumer was find me, sell me. Like you got to hunt me down and then you got to overcome my objections and you got to sell me on your product. And that, that's the old way. The new way is the generosity generation and the consumer is different. The consumer is hear me, like, like really hear me, listen to me, and then help me. Help me find the solution. Help me buy your product. Help me. And if, and if your product helped me or your service helped me, then I'm going to buy it. And then here's the other thing is that if you can't help me, point me in the right direction of somebody who can help me. Mm. And that's the consumer of today. The world mm. has changed. The consumer has changed. They no longer want to be hunted, right? We, we want to be helped. So mm. that's, that's, that's kind of the basics of a, a, of a lot of this and working business by referral. Yeah. Uh, you started as a math teacher if I call it well, right? How come a math teacher became uh, the top, the, the most referred uh, professional in the United States in the area of uh, real estate or generally? Real estate, I, you know, uh, I don't, I didn't, we didn't track anything outside of real estate. So we mm. don't know how we rank outside mm. of real estate, but within real estate, we were doing things nobody had ever done. So I started as a high school math teacher and a coach. Uh, my dad, was an English teacher and a coach. So I kind of followed in his footsteps uh, for the first uh, three or four years out of college. And so I was teaching math and I was coaching three sports. And what happened is the first two summers, I worked on math classes, my math curriculum. So I, I got paid to actually create a new math curriculum. Well, the third summer, two things happened. One, I had already created all the curriculum, so I couldn't get paid anymore to create the curriculum because it was all done. Mm. Number two, I bought my first home. And when I bought my home, the, the, the people that were helping us buy the home, the real estate agents, were just like, man, 
you know what, you'd be great in real estate. And I also knew that investing in real estate was one of the best investments you can ever do. So I thought I'll get my real estate license so I can learn more about investing in real estate and I'll have my real estate license in case something else happens. Mm. Well, Sasa, something else happened. You know, I, I, I ended up one of my softball friends uh, bought a home and he, uh, he ended up, um, we had a housewarming party for him. So he bought the home, got in about 45 days after I threw a housewarming party for him because, you know, I had plenty of time and hmm. I thought, you know what, wouldn't it be cool to have a party, you know, at his house, not my house. So we had a party at his house and saw, so I got 11 referrals yeah. at that very first housewarming party. You know, and, that's... And Sorry for the interruption. That is probably the best example. Uh, that the best example in your book: how to generate referrals uh, through fun and minimum expenses. That's right. And and in fact, we had sponsors. So I actually made money having the party, and then and then I made money on the eleven referrals. Mm. So we we had other people in the real estate industry who had worked on that transaction and were willing to give back some of the money that they had made to help the party happen. And, and so we actually profited from the party a little bit, wasn't a big deal, mm -hmm. but also generated 11 referrals. And, and those referrals went back out to my referral partners, like lenders and title and warranty and, and inspectors and things like that. So it was just like this, this thing that fed itself and uh, before I knew it, you know, we, we were generating, you know, a uh, hundred and then 250 and then 500 referrals uh, in a year where the mm -hmm. average real estate agent gets five or six. That's so we were actually a hundred times the national average as far as referrals. And I didn't even know, I didn't even know we, it was special until a guy named Howard Brenton did an interview like this. And, uh, except it was, you know, except it was on a cassette tape. Uh, yeah, I probably won't go there, but he sent that out to a list of a hundred thousand real estate agents, a hundred thousand agents who were on his list and my phone blew up and my email blew up. Everybody wanted to know, how are you getting 500 referrals a year when I'm getting six or seven? And so, you know, all these people were asking me about the house ring party, about the networking yeah. stack, about the, you know, about all these things that we we're doing. And I was like, I was trying to answer them, but I knew that I was giving them a, an answer, not the answer. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, man, I really need to write a book. And for two years, I was like everybody else who needs to write a book. I didn't write a book. I didn't even put paper to uh, ink to paper at all. And then, uh, uh, this is kind of an interesting deal is, is that on December 13th, 2007, I had knee surgery. I, I played a lot of athletics in my day and it, my right knee just basically wore out and I had knee surgery on the 13th. They told me to go home and take it easy. The next uh, Monday I was at home and uh, I was, I was making calls and I noticed that just on phone calls, I was running out of breath. I was, I was like, man, what? And then I got a pain in my side that just didn't go away. And, and I asked my wife, you know, think, man, I, I am not breathing right. And I've got a pain in my side. You know, what should we do? Of course, my wife is the all knowing, right? So she goes, we should go to the emergency room. So we go to the hospital that night. They checked me out. Couldn't really figure out what was wrong. The next morning, Tuesday morning, December 18th, 2007, uh, I was laying there and I woke up to a nurse who was running a sonogram on my leg. And I was just like, whoa, you know, what are you doing? And what was interesting is that um, as soon as she started doing that, I was hooked up to a monitor and I noticed that the, the monitor started slowing down. The monitor was hooked up to my heart and I felt, I started to feel really cold and I started to feel like my fingers and my toes were ice cold. And I just felt really heavy. 
And, and I, I was like, ma'am, I don't feel too well. And she's like, it, you know, 23 year old nurse. She's like, it'll only take me 30 seconds. I'm almost done. And then I really didn't feel well about 15 seconds later. And, and I, I, I go, ma'am, I don't feel well, or at least that's how it sounded to me. And then Sasa, I actually heard my own heart flatline. So I flatlined beep, and I was laying there and I, uh, she ran off. Think about that. Like you're dying and the nurse runs out. <laughs> well, it ended up 37 seconds later, I came to the head nurse had resuscitated me uh, with a defibrillator and um, you know, I came to and, and it was one of those where it's like, you know, wow, what, you know, what happened? Well, uh, what ended up happening is I had seven blood clots and I had three blood clots that went into uh, each lung and then one that had tried to kill me. It went through my heart and they, they wheeled me down to, intense, or down to the surgery room. They put in a temporary pacemaker um, and that night in intensive care in ICU in Olathe, Kansas, USA, like this really small hospital. I outlined on a hospital napkin what became the seven levels of communication. So I got a real wake up call and I thought, man, I just about died with all this wisdom about this system in my head and I had to get it out. And so I got real motivated. And, and my quote that I say on that is, you know, don't wait for a life changing event to change your life. You mm. know, we have the opportunity on a daily basis to change our life and writing that book, changed my life, changed my family's life, mm. even changed the w place we live. We're, we now live in Atlanta, Georgia, USA. Mm. Mm. So it's, it, uh, you know, don't wait for a life-changing event to change your life. Yeah. Uh, how come you decided to write a fiction book? Yeah, so I, I call it a power parable. And the reason I, I call it a power parable is, is that, first of all, we love stories, you know? I mean, I think one of the reasons you really loved the book and reached out to me was because it was a story. Hmm. And so here's the thing. We love a story and Sasa, we hate to be told what to do. Would you agree? Yeah. Like you don't like it when somebody says, yeah. go get me the whatever, right? Hmm. So here's the thing. Most fiction books or nonfiction books are read. They're written in a way that kind of tells you what to do. And it's like, we don't, we, we kind of bristle at that. And studies have shown that when you read a nonfiction book, you don't necessarily implement what is being told because you're being told what to do. Mm. Whereas with a story, it was the perfect vehicle to show Rick's transformation mm -hmm. and show the reader, here's the transformation you can make when you adopt this plan of love, generosity, and appreciation. Mm -hmm. So I could show instead of just telling. And that, you know, the, you know that's, that's a big thing, is, is if we can show somebody how to do it, it's so much better than just telling them to do it. Mm -hmm. And so it was more enjoyable, it was a better vehicle, it was more fun to write, it's more fun to read. And mm -hmm. here, Sasa, it was, We have a connection. Do we have a connection here? Yeah. I can hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Sorry. Okay. So it was just more enjoyable. It was different than anything had ever been written in the real estate space. Mm -hmm. And uh, it became really referable. Mm -hmm. So so that's why I decided to do the story. Yeah, I've. Uh, I think I've listened to a few of your a few of your podcasts. Uh, somewhere you said that first ten thousand copies were sold to the people they uh, personally know you, and they started reading your book because they know you, not because they uh, wanted to gain some value out of it, but they finished the book because they liked it. That's right. They started the book. They bought the book because you know, I, I, because of how I built my business. I built my business being kind of the most generous person around, mm. you know, as, as a helper. I helped a lot of people. I added value to their life. So they were like, 
yeah, here's 30 bucks for your book because you know, you have, uh, you have given me at least 30 bucks. You know, they're like, congratulations, here's 30 bucks. Like you would a kid almost, you know, it's like, all right, you mowed my lawn, here's 30 bucks, you know? Well, what happened is they started reading it because of me, you know, but they finished reading it because of themselves. They enjoyed the book and they helped, you know, and honestly, that first 10,000 helped us sell 50,000 copies really quickly because they read it and then they were so happy for me in the beginning, but they were so happy about the book when they finished the book. Mm. And that, that was a big, that was a big thing, right? I mean, and you know what? People will buy from you once if you've delivered value to them, but they will then refer your service and refer your, your, your product. Um, when you, uh, when you do a good service and you do a good product, right? Mm. So if my book had sucked, I would have, I would have writ, I would have had 10,000 sales, which is fantastic, mm. you know, for, but, but the fact is you've got to get referred and then you've also got to deliver the goods. You've got to have a great product. You've mm. got to have a great service. Yeah. You know, it took me three years to write 7L and get it out. Mm -hmm. You know, it took me two years to write it and then a year to get it out. You, well, first, you first decided to go uh, to self-publish the book and then Barnes and Noble uh, became your publisher, right? Actually, Ben Bella, became, we had three. Okay, so it, that's kind of an interesting sidelight is, is that, you know, some people want to go to a publisher and get their book published yeah. and things like that. But, but you have no leverage. You know, if, if you have an idea, maybe you even have your book written. Mm. But the thing is, is you really have no leverage. But once you've sold yeah. 10,000, 25,000 copies, yeah. you know, the, it's easy, easy for the publisher to sign you because yeah. you've already proven that it's a success, yes. you know. And that's something I try to explain the, to people in Croatia. Uh, if you don't have the leverage, if you don't have uh, sold units, uh, the publisher won't uh, reply to your email. That's right. That's exactly right. So I tried, so, to, I tried to publish my book in the United States and didn't got <laughs> an email back, you know. Like, yeah, yeah. It, and it's tough, right? I mean, it, it's yeah. one of those where you got to prove it, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's like anything in, in the publisher's world. It's a guessing game. I understand where they're coming from. Yeah, too. definitely. But but uh, I'm a firm believer in, in self publishing. I really am. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a, I'm a believer in self publishing because it, it forces you to get off your butt and go sell some books. And it, it's one where you have complete control. You control everything. And, and I think that you get to the point where you're selling a lot of books, you've got to start handing that off. That's where a publisher comes in mm -hmm. is where, where you can't handle it anymore. That's so, a fantastic information. Yeah. So yeah. Our, our publisher in, in Europe and uh, Asia is Little Brown. So mm -hmm. we actually have two, we actually have three different publishers. Um, we have Little Brown in Europe. We have... Um, Ben Bella in the United States, mm -hmm. and then we own the rights to the audio. So it, it's kind of a kind of an interesting deal. Yeah. But um, so that's it. You know, I, I mean, I, my joy is that every day I help businesses build their business based on a foundation of love, generosity, and mm -hmm. appreciation. On the love, it's do what you love, love what you do, fall in love with your own product, fall in love with your customers, and and then do what you love, right? I, I refuse to, to, to do things that I don't love. Now, in the beginning, did I do things I didn't love, like paperwork and-, mm, and, and Me too. Yes, <laughs> yeah, everybody, right? You gotta yeah. do it. Um, and, then, and then the second part is generosity, is if you wanna be the most referred professional in your industry or in your community, then be the most generous professional. Uh -huh. that, doesn't, that doesn't mean yeah. money. You don't have to just, sometimes people equate generosity with, with money, but it's not. Generosity can be a kind word. It could be praise. It could be you connecting uh, somebody to somebody else, you know, your team. Your team is all the people you know. And I, I have to tell you, that's a power. Build your team. Build your team of referral partners. Build mm -hmm. your team with really strong people. Like now, I can refer people to your podcast because I know you, you know? Yeah. And so ABC, the old ABC in the ego era, 
was mm -hmm. A, always B, B, C, closing. closing yeah. Always be closing people, which is so manipulative. In today's world, we're in the generosity generation. The ABC is always be connecting. Mm -hmm. Always be connecting. We need to be always be looking to connect people to other people. Like right now, I'm thinking, who can I connect to you for a future podcast episode? Uh -huh. You know, that's, that's, that's my... That's the mindset. That's, that's the right mindset. That's the mindset. That's right. Yeah, you said uh, something like, um, uh, don't do a marketing plan, do a communication plan. Uh, make a communication plan, right? Yes. Yeah. So... so What's the difference? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Well, first and foremost, marketing is a subset of communication. Marketing uh -huh. is just one way that you communicate to your community and to your customers. So, so what we wanna do is we wanna have a communication plan. So the communication plan is, is, all right, how do we market to strangers is part of it. But I have found that how do we communicate with friends is more important than how we market to strangers. And in some cases, I really believe it is time to stop marketing to strangers, and it is time to start communicating with friends. So first and foremost, build friends. Mm -hmm. Second of all, is your, build a system a, or a business that is so good that your friends will refer you. I, I have to tell you, I, purpose in life, right? People, I believe that our purpose in life is to be referable. Mm -hmm. I really do. Because what is a referable person like? Number one, they're high character. So, so you know what? You can trust them. They have integrity. They do what they say they're going to do. They finish what they, they say. They, they, typically, they're on time, right? So they're, they're really they're high character. But it's not just high character that makes somebody referable. It's also high competence. You need to be really good at what you do really good be the expert be the best don't be a jack of all trades master the one master that one thing that you can be referred for or you're already being referred for the third c of referability is communication mm -hmm. listen if you can be the highest integrity most trustworthy person in the world who knows a lot about a certain subject or are great at something but if you don't communicate that Nobody would even know. Mm -hmm. So, so, and I truly believe that if you're going to build a business, seek to build the most referable business in your industry. Like, what does that mean? You got to, mm -hmm. if you're not building a referable business, then what the heck are you doing? Are you manipulating? Are you cheating? Are you lying? Are you, are you, you know, it's like build a referable business so mm -hmm. that that is the way that we need to grow. So if you think of a communication plan versus a marketing plan, a marketing plan is always chasing strangers. Mm -hmm. A communication plan is attracting friends, mm -hmm. is attracting more business. Can you, so, give, us, yeah. can you give us an um, example of how yeah. to co communicate your message to the friends or future friends? Yeah, so, yeah. So, so the one way to start this is to identify the most positive, energetic, and successful people you know. Super so connectors. If, Super, yeah, well, maybe they're not super connectors, but at the very least, they're connectors. Okay. Usually, you meet connectors who will then introduce you to super connectors. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll meet Jeff Crooks, who introduces you to Denise Mills. Denise Mills is the super connector. And that's where a lot of people mess up, is they meet the connector and then never get the opportunity to really meet the super connector. And they also, when Jeff refers, then they're like all happy and they're all happy and they celebrate with Jeff. But we forget to think about who was it that connected us to Jeff? Well, it was Denise. Mm. So it's like, you know, we need to really think about who connected us to who and, and, and who connected us to them. And, and that's the great retrace that's out of 7L. That, that's a story for another day, maybe. So but who is the, one of those, sorry, yeah. sorry for the interruption. What's the difference, uh, what's the specific difference between a connector and a super connector? So a, a super, super connector has two things. One is they have a large network, but two, they are willing to connect you 
to all of the people in their network. It's complete and utter trust. That's the difference. A connector is going to connect you to some of their contacts, mm -hmm. maybe one of their contacts. But And you can take a connector and build them into a super connector. But it, mm -hmm. it's going to take trust. It's going to take relationship building. It's, it's going to take value exchange, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. But, but the other, I mean, a super connector just has a bigger network or a bigger mm -hmm. team of people they know than, than the others. And, you know, the other part of a super connector is not just knowing a lot of people. They know a lot of successful people. Mm -hmm. They know people who have, you know, $10 million businesses, $100 million businesses, billion dollar businesses, and they know a lot of those. They just run in a more powerful circle. That's a super connector. But mm -hmm. it's not just running in a, I mean, here's the thing. Oprah is a super connector. Mm -hmm. Like she is the super connector, but I don't know her, you know? So she's not a super connector for me, mm -hmm. you know? So it, it, but I'm guessing that Oprah has been a super connector for Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz mm -hmm. and, you know, these other people. So, so it's one of those where it's like, you know, they have to have trust of you and they have to really be of connection with you. Mm -hmm. So to go back to the communication plan, it's, it's one of yep. those where we, we need to identify the top people in our network. And you got to realize if you know a thousand people, you really need to be focused on 100 to 150 of those on a monthly basis. And you're communicating with that 100 to 150. That's so different than marketing or sales or advertising or what everybody's saying you got to do everything with everybody yeah you, you know, believe you, that you you believe that 80 percent of your time should be invested in communication or value with, with your top 20 percent yeah. yeah that's exactly right so in this case i mentioned the top 10 to 15 percent mm -hmm. but yeah we really and 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 here's what will happen as you like at my point in my life right now i mean i know hundreds of thousands of people but here's the thing I still focus my energies on the top 100 to 150. That's uh, the Pareto principle, right? That is, uh, the Pareto principle is 80-20. So yes, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So where I got most of this is really from a, a guy named Professor Robin K. Mm. Dunbar. And that is actually mm. Dunbar's Dunbar's number. number. Yeah. yeah, Dunbar's number is the 150. And so mm. that's that he, you know, according to Dunbar's research, and this has been proven, yeah. through many things, including Facebook, is that the size of our neocortex, mm -hmm. which is the, the part that makes humans human, right? So everybody else has the other part, like a monkey has the other parts of the brain, and then a very small neocortex. Humans have a large neocortex. Well, the part that makes us human, the size of it is only, it only allows us to process 150 great yep. relationships mm -hmm. we're only really now does that that does that does that mean we can only know 150 people nope no yep. it means we can only know 150 people really well that's what it means so when you focus to 150 what ha and and that's like these sales shops if you have a thousand customers you should not have one sales rep handling a thousand customers you need to figure out how many times does 150 go into a thousand, which is like mm -hmm. seven, right? And mm -hmm. I would have seven reps who handle 150 clients a piece. And they build phenomenal relationships with each of those 150. Mm -hmm. So uh, so that's who I focus on. I mean, Sasa, it's so funny. I mean, it's like, right? You're mm -hmm. like, oh my God, you use a three ring binder and paper? I use a three ring binder and a paper because it can go anywhere, everywhere I need, mm -hmm. you know? And, and do I have this information in digital and data? Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. But you know what? There's nothing like having it top of mind every single day. I love my people yeah. and they love me. And you know what? The reason I have had success is because I changed my sales mindset. So, so you're going to love this. Maybe how, gonna... how did you do it? You went yeah, from so the I, ABC to... <laughs> I, well, here's the thing. I, I changed my sales mindset from praying on the weak to partnering with the strong. And sales is taught to prey on the weak, overcome objections, always be closing. Yeah. You know, if you've seen the wolf on Wall Street, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. he, he's flipping them off on the phone. He's, mm -hmm. you know, he, he's making fun of them 
on the phone, you know, and the things like that. And it's like, that's preying on the weak. Mm -hmm. But what we really need to be doing is partnering with the strong, mm -hmm. partner with the strong. And I will tell you that, but that, that, that like, listen, be prepared for growth because when you partner with the strong, first of all, you got to get the strong to meet with you, which is a challenge if they don't know you, mm -hmm. right? You got to use the, yeah. you got to use the inward rule or the value rule, which is, you know, the inward is that you're going to get introduced to people from people you already know. Mm -hmm. The second thing is when you partner with the strong, you have to show up better. You're going to ask better questions. You're going to yep. be humble. You're, and I, I, to this day, I remain very humble because I keep meeting these really, these people who are far superior to me in intelligence, wisdom, strategy, mindset, energy, you know, all these different things. Mm -hmm. So, so it's one of those where partnering with the strong ma makes for a really strong network and you become better because you're partnering with the strong. You, I mean, you're the average of the five people you hang out with most, according to Jim Rohn. And my dad used to repeat that all the time, mm -hmm. especially in high school when I was hanging around with the wrong people. It happened. Mm -hmm. But you know what I've discovered with partnering with the strong is that the more you hang out with the strong, the stronger you become. Mm -hmm. The more you hang out with the weak or take advantage of the weak, the weaker you become, the weaker your mind becomes, and mm -hmm. the worse your life ends up. Whereas with partnering with strong, my life is so much better because of the people I hang out with and the people I've learned from. Mm -hmm. So you, I grew Michael, up very poor. Yeah, Michael, sorry. Uh, how do you define uh, who is uh, strong under your criteria? So anybody who is more successful, more wealthy, mm. more, uh, more connected. You know, yeah, more competent in a certain yeah. avenue, uh, mm. more connected. Uh, whatever it may be. And I have to tell you, one of the best things you can do, and this, this goes straight to something that anybody can implement. This is what I implement. I didn't even know it was a strategy, but I would meet with someone who was connected to me, or I just to be talking to a friend and I would go, Hey, listen, I'm doing this business thing. I'm doing real estate. And you know, who would you go to for business advice or who should I talk to? And they would say, you know what? You need to talk to, to James. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I would meet with James. I would buy him lunch, you know, mm -hmm. and never dinner, always mm -hmm. lunch. Cause lunch Why? is cheap. Yeah. Lunch is cheap. Okay. Dinner is expensive. So, mm. you know, the best thing you can do is buy him coffee. That's the cheapest thing ever. And you still get the same result. But anyway, that's a story for another day, <laughs> but I had no money, you know, so I had no money. So I would meet him for lunch or coffee. And then I would, I would, uh, be, ask them all these questions. I wasn't looking I didn't say, well, you know, you know, are you looking to buy or sell real estate? You know, do you, do you, do you know people who need, you know, do you know anybody that needs to be buying, selling or investing in real estate? I didn't say any of that. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, all right, what made you a business success? What drives you on a daily basis? Like if you had one or two words to sum up your superpower, what would it be? You know, what, what, uh, what should I do as a, a new business owner that would help me grow my business the fastest? What, you know, what were some mistakes that you made along the way that you can help me avoid? Like I just rattled off five to six questions that I would ask, you know, very humble, always looking. And then I would say, here's the thing. If you were looking for business advice, who would you go to? And they would tell me a name or they would think about it and then tell me a name. And I go, here's the thing. I would have the same conversation with them. Can't, would you mind introducing me mm -hmm. to that, to that successful person that, you know, mm -hmm. and you know what? 90% of the time they said yes. And mm -hmm. guess who I now got to meet? I got to meet another successful person. I'd have coffee or lunch. I'd talk to them. I learned a lot. And so I learned really quickly from these, these mentors, you know, they, they weren't official mentors, but they were kind of unofficial yep. mentors. And the other thing Sasa that I found out is that when, uh, when somebody has a million dollar business, they refer you or connect you or introduce you to somebody who has a $5 million business. And wow. the $5 million business, business person introduces you to the $10 million mm -hmm. person business. So, so you tend to naturally, in fact, I will tell you, the connections got stronger faster than I did. 
And so I was like, whoa, you know, a hundred million dollar, like talking to that person, I got nothing. You know, I'm like, I, I don't even know if I could implement what they're going to say. How did you feel, so, Michael? <laughs> yeah. So I had to, I had to reel it back a little bit yeah. and just say, all right, you know what, let me, let me, let me really build with the five to $10 million people and, and go from there. And, and you know what? It was my own fright. It was my own. Yeah. I was growing faster than my mindset. And, and anytime that happens, you will have what I call success suicide, success suicide is when you're you're going gangbusters you're you're everything's going well everything's going and then and then you commit success suicide which is like you uh get sick or you break a leg uh-huh. or you um or here's the other thing right you 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 find a happy distraction right you you find another opportunity or you find another distraction like 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 a business opportunity or a yeah hobby exactly or... so a business opportunity so you know it 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 happens so often is is your um you know you you you're doing real estate and you're starting to do really well and then somebody offers you a really good job you know and you're like oh man and you really have to search back and go you know dang you know, why, why am I in real estate or why am I in sales or whatever, Mm -hmm. where I could go over here and it could be, you know, it could be consistent pay. It can be this, it can be that, you know, but the problem is, is most salespeople like myself, we're the worst employees in the world. You know, we don't want to be told what to do. We don't want to be controlled. We don't want to run by the rules of, of all the, 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 you know, the business, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. We don't want to have a ton of meetings, you know, So it, so it's one of those where, um, you know, it, it, and sometimes a positive is something that can derail you and, and you got to stay focused. You know, everybody's waiting for that brilliant idea, you know, that, that, and I will tell you that success is, is not a moment of brilliance, right? Success is excellence. So what is excellence? Excellence is brilliance plus resilience it's brilliance plus resilience that makes excellence don't seek brilliance seek excellence we really need more excellence in the world and i will tell you right now right now especially is that we need to be a lighthouse of excellence in a sea of mediocrity there is so many so many people are okay with average and that's okay for them but it's not okay for you it's not okay for me Be a lighthouse of excellence, brilliance plus resilience. Sometimes the resilience is going to be the thing that carries you. Sometimes the brilliance is the thing that carries you. But sometimes the brilliance comes from the resilience. You continue to work within the realm, you're going to get more moments of brilliance. So. Anyway, I didn't mean to go on a tangent. That's there. why that's why you use a, a lighthouse on your handwritten cards, right? <laughs> that's right. I, you know what? I had handwritten notes. I wrote them. They're all gone. Okay. But uh, I had I had my handwritten co- note cards right here. Yes, I use a lighthouse on all of my on all of my handwritten yeah. cards. I, I wanted to ask you, Michael, how do you reciprocate Hello. on? How do you reciprocate on the people who helped you? Um, Uh, expand your network how do you so, reciprocate do you have a system like or it's uh, you're yeah. just natural yeah no no i mean i i've had to systematize and i mean i leverage technology a ton because you have to you know because you have to figure out so um i took notes and i would keep notes that's the first thing that i would mm-hmm. say is really important is is keeping notes because you know there's so many things I could say right now, but I'm going to boil it down to one mm-hmm. word, which is appreciation. You know, when, when somebody connects you to somebody else, they don't want money. You know, they don't even necessarily want help. What they really want is appreciation. Mm-hmm. They want to appreciate, they want you to remember that you connected them to this really good person. So what so, do you do? Yeah. So a couple of things, right? So mm-hmm. first of all, so Sasha, if, if like, who is the, who is the most, who's the most successful person, you know, or if you were looking to get business advice, 
who would you personally go to? I would personally uh, try to find uh, several books on the topic. I know, but I'm, I'm, ask, I'm actually asking you this question. So hmm. who do you, who, like a person, who do you go to for business advice or who do you have high-minded yeah. conversations? Yeah. To someone who uh, had the problem like mine and solved it. Okay. So I'm, a, I'm actually going to ask you for a personal reference. Like I oh. want to know a name of a person who you would go to for business advice, like out of your friends, out of the people you know, and you want to grow this podcast to being one of the top in the world, or you have a business idea and you want to run it by someone. Who would you who would you talk to? Hmm, personally. I don't know, probably someone from the Shark Tank. Do you know the people from Shark Tank? I could probably contact uh, Robert Herjovic because he's from the same town uh, where, where I was born. <laughs> Do you know somebody that knows Robert Herjovic? Uh, I think I, I could find someone, yeah. Okay, so so maybe going to that person, you know what I mean? Mm. So here's the thing is, is are, would you be open to introducing me to Robert Herjavec? Yeah, definitely would. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so when I meet with Robert, right? So, so I'm going to, I'm going to contact him in the next couple of days. Can you make your contact in the next couple of days? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So here's the thing. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, go through the connection, your connection. I'm going to meet Robert. When I meet with Robert, either by zoom or in person, how can I make that meeting the biggest win for you, Sasa? Okay, good example, yeah. Right, so how can I make that the biggest win mm. for you? You could say something like, well, if you could just mention my yeah. product or mention yeah. my service, or if you could just thank me in front of him mm. for making the connection, mm. right? Or you might say, don't worry about it, right? Yep. It's a big win that the two of you guys are meeting. Okay, okay. okay. Now, I meet with Robert Herjavec. As soon as I make the appointment, I'm going to text or call or email you and say, I wanted to let you know, Robert and I are meeting. I just wanted to say thank you so much. I'm going to meet with Robert. I'm going to immediately after the meeting, I'm going to follow up with Robert appropriately using a 333, 444. 333 is three things you can do in three minutes that give you three days of excellent service. And that is, I'm going to text him. I'm going to call and leave a message or email, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to write a handwritten note. Now, after I get done with the 333, I am then going to text message you. And I'm going to say, Sasa, met with Robert today. It went fantastic. One of the things I mentioned was your product that does this, blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah. And, and I just wanted to let you know that he may be contacting you or you might want to follow up with him in the next couple of days to say, ask him how our meeting went. Yeah. Great right. example. Great example. Right. So then down the road, if Robert refers me, let's say Robert refers me to Barbara Corcoran. Okay. So I, so I would then say, I would actually call you, let's say Barbara refers me and I would say, Hey, listen, I just wanted to let you know, Sasa, do you know Barbara Corcoran? Mm -hmm. uh, I just know her or from I just know her from the show. Barbara was connected to me by Robert Herjavec. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. You remember Robert, right? And you're like, yes, of course. And I go, here's the thing is, is you connected me to Robert. So the reason for my call is I wanted to call and express my appreciation to you, Sasa, for connecting me to Robert. Because without you doing that, I would have never been connected to Barbara and I would have never had the opportunity that Barbara gave me today. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great example, Michael. Great example. So it doesn't cost a dime. It's mm -hmm. what people really want. It shows you remembered. It shows you care, but it also shows that you are continuing to be connected and referred. You know, mm -hmm. it, I mean, what wasn't said is that right there is I'm still referable. Well, I didn't have to say that because Barbara referred me. So you're just like, well, you know, people are still referring and connecting Michael, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which, which, you know, did you have, saying, sorry, yeah. did you have any negative experiences, uh, like, oh, with yeah. someone you? 
and wanted something, uh, wanted you to reciprocate, you know what I mean? Um, so to be totally honest, with, not, not a ton. So yes, you will occasionally get the person who is either in desperation on the money side mm. uh, or very money driven. Mm. And, and I would just say that you're going to be at a decision point in the relationship do you want to continue knowing it's a monetary relationship or do you want to just like dissolve that relationship, mm. which is as easy as not communicating um, and go over and build more powerful non-monetary mm. relationships. The weakest relationships are monetary relationships. Mm. The strongest relationships are non-monetary relationships. They're social relationships. They're value exchanges. Mm. So, so the, the fact of the matter is most people don't refer you for the money. They don't. Definitely not. They, they yeah. refer you to help their friend look good or solve a problem. And that's it. Yeah. You know, I mean, some people will refer you just to look good. And I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. Some people will refer you to, to help their friend. They sincerely want to help their friend or help you. And then, then you'll have that group that, you know, they, they want to refer you because it, it, it you know, it's a bigger picture thing. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you, you're aware of the concept, of course you are the concept of the ideal client. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Are you, uh, do you have like the system of ideal connector or ideal person you want to connect with or a person that you wouldn't let uh, come closer to you? <laughs> can you spot, uh, or, yeah. or in other yeah. words, can you spot a taker in communication uh, when you yeah. see one? Yes. So, uh, you know, we call them ambassadors. You know, what you're, what you're talking about is it, we call them ambassadors. Like my mm -hmm. book that I just showed you mm -hmm. is it's called my ambassador's book. Mm -hmm. So, well, you know, cool. so we call them ambassadors and, and we are developing something called an A score, which is an ambassador score. So what are the characteristics and traits of an ambassador? And, and so the answer is if they have these, they are typically better referral sources. Now, are there exceptions? Yes, there are. But when somebody is a straight to the point person, they tend to be uh, a better referral source. If they are a social and outgoing person, they tend to be a mm -hmm. better referral source. If somebody is steady and dependable, they're not as good a referral source. If somebody is cautious and perfectly accurate, they tend not to be a great referral source really? because they're cautious. Yeah, they're cautious. Yep. They're, they're caught. They're too cautious to, to connect to unknowns, you know, or even if they know them, they're afraid of the unknown in the middle. What happens mm -hmm. when those two meet the, 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 the straight to the point person doesn't care the straight to the point's like, Oh, that'll save me time. So I need to connect these two mm -hmm. people. The mm -hmm. social and outgoing person is, Oh, they're going to love each other. I need to put them together. You know? Yeah. So, um, and, and just so you know, that's from the DISC there's, yeah, there's yeah, in my yeah. book, I talk about the DISC, yes. but the D's and the I's tend to be better, better connectors and better referral sources. Not always the case. Yep. I have, I have S's, I have C's who are referral sources. Yeah. But uh, we can make a general rule that for example, extroverts are better, uh, referral sources than introverts, because in one interview you said you, you, you believe you're more of an introvert than an extrovert. Did you? I am an introvert. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm probably a three or four on a scale of one to 10. So mm -hmm. everybody's one to 10, one, and, and don't judge anything by the numbers, but a one would be like an introvert who stays home all the time, very antisocial. A 10 is extremely social, like has to, has to have people, you know? And introvert and extrovert, they get their energy in different ways. An introvert gets their energy by retreating like a battery. They got to recharge. Whereas a, an extrovert will recharge through people. They get the energy from, from other people. And I'm, I'm like a three or four. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm mostly introverted uh, with I'm okay with social settings. I'm not okay with social settings where I don't know anybody. You'll never see me yep. at the yep. open party, you know. Uh, and it's so funny. People are like, you're a speaker. You're out. Yeah. Introverts are great in social settings they control. Mm -hmm. And that's the power, right? I speak yep. a lot. I have control. I throw events. Yep. I have events. I have control. Mm -hmm. So, 
Um, so, you know, it's one of those where, but I will say that you got to be careful with the, that you can actually have an introverted eye. You can, you know, social uh, like and outgoing. The eye is the influence, right? Inter that influence. That's exactly right. Influence. Yeah. yeah. Are you watching the Daily Dose? It sounds like you've been watching the Daily Dose. <laughs> so it's like, you know, all this stuff. That's a fan. It's fantastic. So thank you. Yeah. And then, all right. So go to like professions, you know, professions who make great referral sources are those in the sales professional because they understand the word referrals. They understand how it works, right? The game is played. And mostly the, they're doing it subconsciously, right? Without yeah. the system. That's right. And, and, and um, you know, business owners, salespeople, realtors, lenders, um, financial planners, insurance agents, the, the thing that they have an advantage is they understand that they're in a referral game. They understand they're in the game and they understand the rules mm -hmm. of the game. Whereas an engineer or a programmer or a coder or a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad, they, they, they aren't necessarily in the game. So they don't necessarily mm -hmm. like play the game. Now, yes, yes. do we have stay-at-home moms and stay-at-home dads who are very good referral sources? The answer is yes, yes. but they're the exception. Yes. And I'm not gonna pour a lot of my time, energy, effort, money into the exception. I'm gonna pour it into the rule. Mm -hmm. So I tend to wanna network with business owners and entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. salespeople. Yep. So there, there's a, you know, the larger their social network, the more likely they are to refer. So mm -hmm. one of the questions that we ask people is how many contacts do you have on your phone? So if you go to your phone and you go to contacts, do you have an iPhone or Android? Android. All right. So if you go at the very end, mm -hmm. there's a little number sign, right? It will tell you how many contacts are in your phone, right? So how okay. many contacts do you have? It's not a contest. It's just a question. <laughs> I would probably lose this contest, Michael. <laughs> Uh, probably. Huh. Context. Ooh. I think it doesn't say. I think it doesn't say the, the, the specific number. Is, do you see a number sign? Nope. Nope. Can you go to the bottom of the Z's? Yes. I that? am at the bottom of the Z's. Okay. Yeah, but I don't see the number sign. Okay. Probably around thousands, not too many. Yeah. 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 I you know, I don't know it all, but I'd guess in a thousand. So, yeah. you know, you you would be someone that that would make a great referral source, right? Thank you. So, so somebody that's got over a thousand contacts typically mm -hmm. in their phone is typically somebody that that is a good referral source. So that, Yeah, but that's, also the quality of these contacts, right? That's right. That's right. So here's the other thing is do they have a friend, family member, or relative who does what you do, right? If they mm. have that, then they're not going to be a good referral yep. source. So if somebody has a family member who's a mm. realtor, they're going to go to that realtor instead of you, you know? So no you matter know what that. you do, no, no matter what you do, no matter how well you communicate or how well can you sell, right? That's right. That's right. And then it's a, it, it, it's a frequency thing too. So one of the questions that we'll ask is, you know, how often do you recommend someone to your friends, family members, and the people you know? So mm -hmm. we'll ask them, how often do you do that? And they're like, well, you know, you know, I don't know, or whatever. And then the second question is like, when is the last time you recommended another person to someone you know? Mm -hmm. And and if it was yesterday, they're probably going to be a good good referral source. Mm -hmm. If it was six years ago, they're probably not going to be a good referral source. Yep, yep. You know, and so, yeah. yeah, sorry. And but uh, I'm, I'm sure you had a situation when your uh, referral system didn't produce results as you expected. Oh, yeah. Because because I uh, gave up mostly. Uh, this is the reason why I gave up uh, from the referral, mostly referral system, because it failed in 2017. And I also caught you talking about a lady that gave uh, 56 referrals and only received four. Mm -hmm. These are the situations when you cannot completely rely on um, your referral system. How well, no matter how good you are as a referral source, uh, how well you reciprocate, but there are times when a referral system can 
uh, outperform. Uh, I, I don't mean outperform, they can fail. Well, it depends on what you uh, determine as a failure, right? Yeah. I, I out refer everyone I know, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, they, it really, I mean, I'm going to give 10 referrals to every one referral I get from almost anyone. Mm. And, and you know what, you got to live with that. But yep. the thing is, is I, I'll tell you that the answer to your question, like to get you back winning the referral game, my advice to you would be events. Once the, once the virus, once the quarantine times, that kind of thing hmm. is, is, is start to have, now you could have online events and do a lot of the yeah. same stuff. But the thing about events, remember seven levels of communication, advertising, direct mail, electronic communication at the bottom. Hmm. You've got handwritten notes in the middle, and hmm. then you've got phone calls, events and seminars and one-on-one -on -one meetings. Hmm. One-on-one -on -one meetings are where most sales occur. If you're going to try to sell a big million-dollar contract, it's going to be done in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, most likely. Maybe there'll be an attorney in there and a couple other people, but it's one-on-one. -on -one. But the thing is, is, is events and seminars. This is the second highest level, and it's for a reason, because it's leverageable mm -hmm. and it's scalable. You know, we just had a gal last fall, Sasha, she got 209 referrals in one weekend. She received... Now, this is a gal who usually gives out mm. lots of referrals, but she received 209 referrals. The only way that that could have happened is at an event. So have an event and you can get more referrals because yeah, there's more people in there. It's easier to provide value at an event definitely, than it is yes. even a one-on-one -on -one or a phone call because you have the added value of social interaction. They get value from the others in the group. You're not responsible for providing all the value. So I will tell you that in 7L, I didn't have time to go into our event system. So guess what? I need to write another book. But the thing that I would just suggest to you is that leverage events, leverage events, have events, and uh, you're going to be able to get multiple referrals. So have events for your clients, but also have events for everyone you know, you know, a happy hour or whatever it may be. Yeah, now, I, I totally agree with you because that's the stuff I did after reading your book, you know, but yeah. also there are, there are times when the referrals fail, like uh, in that lady's, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, that lady's example, how come she didn't make it? How come she only received like less than 10% back um, by giving 56 away? Yeah. What, so what was the know, problem? Yeah. You know, she wasn't complaining though, you know, because 56, she got, she gave out 56. And so if you think she's a real estate, so she was giving out uh, referrals to inspectors. She was giving out referrals to financial planners. She was mm. giving out referrals to um, lenders, all the, I mean, so honestly, as a real estate agent, I'm going to give out eight for every one transaction I do. So when I work with a buyer or seller, I refer sellers to stagers and inspectors and warranty companies. That's three right there to my one. If it's a buyer, then I'm gonna refer them out to a lender, to an inspector, maybe two or three inspectors, warranty, insurance agent, uh, contractors who do repairs. Um, you know, So I'm gonna give out eight to 10 to one as a natural process. She yep. never tracked it before. So she was probably always doing 56 to four, but you notice she wasn't complaining because those four in real estate in, in the United States, it's, you know, she, she's in a situation where she's probably making five or six or more thousands of dollars for every one of those referrals. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you look at the income of the 56 compared to the income of the four, it's, probably equal or the realtor might have even more income yeah but she can definitely improve her system right? oh yeah 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 so so yeah she probably needs to incorporate events more and the other thing is is she probably needs to incorporate the great retrace on the four referrals that she got she mm. really needs to track back and say who referred them and then who referred the referral source you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then and trace that back using the great retrace Great, great. Uh, Michael, 
Thank you very, very much for your time. And I would like to thank Borna for making the introduction, uh, contacting you. You were on my list for like two and a half years. Yeah. I wanted to reach out to you, but this coronavirus uh, speeded things up. Uh, yeah. You're a very passionate, motivated guy, and you're just the right fit for our creation podcast, Surove Strasti. I really, I really appreciate your time, Michael. Well, I'll tell you, thanks a ton. I, I, I enjoyed every minute of this, Sasa. It's just like, I love having high-minded conversations with people who really get it, and you're that person. Like, we had conversation about